Hello everyone, it's Shane Conto, your Wasteland reviewer, and welcome to Wasteland Talks, my weekly talk show where I talk about whatever the hell I want. And this week is a, a new episode of the Wasteland Spotlight, where we're going to highlight four films that are mostly related, as these are some interesting fantasy animated films from that 70s, 80s era of animation that isn't Disney. Um, and joining me for this episode is my friend from Sif Pop, Patrice. Thank you so much for coming on. Awesome. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to talk fantasy animation. Yes. And there's a trigger warning on this episode. It's not our fault if you're triggered by the rotoscope in <laughs> The Lord of the Rings. Um, that's not on us. Uh, oh, man. It was, I feel like you read my, did you read my letterbox review. I did check that out. I'm just like, that was pretty much my entire letterbox review. <laughs> well, because I'm pretty sure I remember watching Darby. Like, I love Darby O'Gill and the Little People. I've been watching oh, that since too. I was a little yeah. kid. And like you know, you have like those kinds of shots in, it, and like they're supposed to be scary, right? And then half the Lord of the Rings movie was rotoscope, and I'm just like, this feels. I had a hard weird. time watching it. Like it's... I physically had a hard time watching it. Because uh, it was giving me like motion sickness. It took me several times to finish watching as much as I did. And then I kind of ended up just listening to the second half because every time it got to the rotoscope where it was, it was, I think the voice acting is great. The story was great. I loved everything as far as structurally how the, mm -hmm. it, like what they included, what they didn't, you know, that aspect of it. And the parts that are animated fully like where you don't notice that it like you'll notice that the horse is rotoscope because it's moving so naturally, but you don't see the yes. horse through the animation, but the people, mm -hmm. especially like extras and the background kind of stuff were just too much for me. Like I was literally getting like nauseated watching it because uh, especially like the tavern scene where Frodo's yes. that, that was, was the worst. Cause I was just like, this is creepy and it shouldn't be. And it's because there are too much of the people showing through and not enough animation over top of it. <laughs> Which, uh, so I feel like it, we should probably just start with the Lord of the Rings. Oh, hundred percent. I started talking about this. This is from 1978. This is, this is interesting. Cause like, so there's the Lord of the Rings and then there's the return of the King. So I'm assuming they finish the story together because I haven't watched that one yet. Because like this is like half of Lord of the Rings, right? Because um, they didn't have the rights originally. Someone else had done an animated Lord of the Rings, so I guess they didn't get the opportunity to do it the way they wanted to initially, and that's mm -hmm. why we kind of get this melded version, which is very interesting. And this is from director Ralph Bakshi, who has done some interesting films like Wizards fire and ice fritz the cat so like he was one of those animation directors in the 70s who was not disney um which like today you take it for granted because there's so many different animation studios out there but like then it was like disney and then like a handful of like you have like the don bluths of the late 80s into the 90s who was doing animation again like outside of disney and Rankin Bass, which we'll talk about, obviously, because mm -hmm. some of these films are from them. But, like, this, this film was interesting because there were certain things about that, like, I love. And I think they do a good job of adapting this part of the story. Uh, very true. Like, the voice acting is fantastic. Having, like, John Hurt. John Hurt. I mean, oh, Aragorn. my gosh. Yep. <laughs> Anthony Daniels. Anthony Daniels as well. And it's like it's so funny looking through the like the IMDB of a lot of these actors, which right. most of them don't have pictures. Um, mm -hmm. but, but like some of them, it's just like it's so seventies and so eighties. But like, there's a couple of big name people here, and there's some really interesting scenes. Like, oh yeah, I agree. The pub scene is creepy. It's as a hell. Fuel. It's just like. The rotoscope, every human being is rotoscoped. It's like, what the hell's going on in this uh, scene? Like, Frodo and the other hobbits are, like, the only thing that aren't at that point. Yeah. And it's so, like, I, I don't know. Like, it was so distracting. Yeah, it's very jarring. 
<laughs> Which that's the thing, because like how to describe this? The animation of like the characters, like the hand drawn animation, they're not the most attractive of people. No, <laughs> it's, and it's it's very it's very much that Rankin Bass style too that you see throughout. Yeah. Like you see it in The Hobbit, but you also see it in some of the other ones we're going to talk about. Like mm-hmm. they're the bad guys always kind of have those bulbous noses and like the proportions on their heads seem weird yeah you know the hair always looks the same like they've always got that say the same like frazzled hair and stuff mm-hmm. like that like their eyes always look the same and like there's things where you can tell like that is 100 percent the hand-drawn part of this yeah this film and then there's other characters like basically every human like normal human character where it's like that's clearly rotoscope like the yes. horses are all clearly rotoscoped you know and like i said anytime there's like a background actor kind of thing going on like they're always like and there's sometimes it's just they it's like they almost barely just put a filter over it like Mm -hmm. at all it's so live action (laughs) it's there's moments that feel like it fit well because it's supposed to be scary like the ring rings like yeah they're supposed to be creepy and that rotoscope on them is creepy yeah that Um, worked really well there's like the this is interesting because like there's sections of this film that you're going through a lot of material oh and this God, is like yeah. a two hour and twelve minute mm-hmm. movie, but then there's some moments where it like really takes its time, like the Rafes trying to get Frodo. That feels so drawn out. Mm-hmm. Like there's a lot of build up there, and I'm like. Why is this one scene like 15 minutes and right. like a whole entire book is like an hour and a half? Yeah. But the like you said, the voice acting is really well done. I think Ralph Bakshi had such an interesting eye for creating animated worlds. And it is a bold choice to mix these different kinds of animation styles. Mm-hmm. It's just, I'm sure it was very experimental at that point for that and, point sure yeah because like disney wasn't using like rotoscope were, and animation well they were a se. little bit but not much like you really wouldn't so like 101 dalmatians used rotoscope but only for cruella's car and they didn't even use a real car they yeah. literally built the car out of cardboard and moved it to rotoscope it so that's why it's got all those sharp edges and everything because that's what they wanted they wanted the look to be yeah. evil Mm -hmm. but they weren't truly rotoscoping things they were filming everything but that was as reference it wasn't i'm gonna put the cell over the scene and paint Mm -hmm. it like that's not how they were doing it so yeah it's really interesting like how much they use in this and the choices of when (laughs) which i guess it was easier to not have to hand drawn a whole bunch of extras and stuff like that but like it also strange choice but Because, like, I recently had watched The Hobbit as well, mm-hmm. and I really loved that. I think that really worked well. This this definitely was an interesting experience. It definitely feels unsatisfying by the end. Yeah. Because, like, the Lord of the Rings films, the live-action ones, are my favorite films. Oh, yeah. I feel like they do a great job of finding moments to wrap up each film that feel like, okay... I feel like we went on a journey in this one and there's more story to tell and we'll be back. This kind of just like, well, I'm back for more. And it's just yeah. like, when will I come back for more? <laughs> so right. it's like they didn't have a plan when they started. They're just like, we, we need two hours. Like just, just make this two hours in some way. <laughs> two hours and 12 minute animated 12 minutes. film from the, the, from the seven. Which is pretty crazy. That is a yeah. long movie for the time. And I'm not really 100% sure who their audience was supposed to be. Was this supposed to be geared toward me as a kid? Like, I feel like um, kind of can't be. Like, it, it's rough if that's that was their intended, like, just kid. I mean, because at this point, they'd really only done, like, the things they were known for were their Christmas specials. They hadn't done the other stuff um, that they're kind of known for animation-wise. So it's just a weird choice to me of the things they've done. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and this this uh this would be on like never ending story level of like this is gonna scar you as a kid, mm-hmm. um except worse honestly for sure like, 
because some of the visuals in this is just absolutely terrifying. As an adult, mm -hmm. it's just yeah. like, wow, this, this is creating a really creepy environment. And mm -hmm. I can't even imagine watching this as a kid. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't show, like, I'm trying to think, like, I that was 10 when Fellowship came out in 2001. So, like, I was a 10 year old watching that, and there's some scary moments in it because, you know, mm -hmm. Peter Jackson was a horror director. So, he definitely was yeah. going to sprinkle some of that stuff in. But this is scarier. <laughs> yeah. Well, I actually, I didn't see this one until this is the first time I've seen this version. Um, I'd seen The Hobbit when I was a kid, like yeah. probably entirely too young, because I feel like I probably saw it around the age of six or seven. And mm -hmm. it made it so that when The Lord of the Rings came out initially, I did not see it in theaters until Twin Towers came out was when I finally was like, all right, let's get the DVD. I'm ready to watch this because I was scarred by The Hobbit. I mean, that movie ends with a cartoon character's finger getting ripped off. Like that wasn't something you saw, like not from animation in the 80s so if i had seen this one oh my god i don't even know <laughs> well obviously uh bakshi was definitely into making animation not for kids because oh, uh, like i just watched wizards for the first time and that like nazis like yeah. actual nazis it's insanity <laughs> and it, it was wild a friend of mine was like you have never seen this you need to watch this and bought it for me oh my it. god <laughs> and it's it's something else and like fire and ice and like heavy metal like those are obviously for adults oh yeah but like th this lord of the rings is definitely for adults because i don't think mm -hmm. kids would be able to handle this well, do you have anything else you want to add about the Lord the of the Rings? The only other thing that I think is worth mentioning is um, if you are inclined to watch it and not get seasick, pay attention to the background art. Like the paintings they used for the background are super detailed, really well done. Um, I mean, it's obvious that they only did the one reference painting in the background. They didn't do the layered because of the mm -hmm. rotoscoping, probably. They don't have like the different layers of background, but they yep. still are incredibly detailed. And there's really fun things that you find in them, like especially before they leave the Shire. There's really cool stuff just like on the mantles and like by the fireplace and stuff like that. So it's just something like to kind of keep your eye out for when you're watching, because there was a lot of detail that went into that aspect of making this that I really appreciated. And one thing I'll add too is just the actual timeline of the story is a lot more like the book because like in the lord of the rings films the live action ones like frodo leaves like it feels like gandalf went to minas tirith in like five days and was <laughs> back and then like frodo left the shire after like a week maybe yeah. it was little decades in yeah. the book and that was shocking to me when i read the books for the first time I'm like what yeah frodo's like 50 right and it's just like wow well, what does elijah wood do to his skin yeah <laughs> so youthful um but i guess the one other film that we're going to talk about that is pretty well known is the last unicorn which came out in 1982 and this is directed by jules bass and arthur rankin jr so like this is definitely rankin bass production here and Boy, is the voice cast stacked. I mean, just, seriously. Like, you it's... have Mia Farrow playing mm -hmm. the unicorn. Yeah. Like, yeah. right off the bat, it's like, she was a big star. And, like, you have the likes of, like, Love Angela Lansbury. Angela Lansbury oh gosh, makes yeah. everything better. Mm -hmm. uh, Christopher, Christopher Lee. Lee. Um, Even the butterflies in it for, what, three whole minutes? And it's Robert Klein. He wasn't, yeah. like, an obscure comic at that point in time. Like, he was pretty well known. And he's in it for, like, two minutes as a wacky butterfly. <laughs> and then you have Alan Arkin. Alan Arkin. And, like, immediately, I'm like, wow, it's Alan Arkin. And you have oh, Jack then, Bridges, who, yeah. at that point, was a young actor, Um I guess at that point, like, he had been in films for about, like, 10 years with, like, Last Picture Show and stuff like that. But, like, there's really great, talented actors in this. And this is a gorgeous well, even, movie. I love it. This has been one of my favorite movies as long as I can remember. I saw it when I was probably four. Because uh, being a girl in the 80s, I was into unicorns. So yeah, when we saw this, it's like, oh, my gosh, yeah, we're renting it. Like, that, 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 that movie right there. <laughs> 
and I've loved it ever since. Uh, and it's got some of my favorite voice actors doing some of the background, like littler characters too, like Paul Freeze and Don Messick, who I love. Yeah. I mean, they've just, you know, Scooby-Doo does the voice of all kinds of people in this. Mm -hmm. And then Paul Freeze, the voice of the ghost host at the Haunted Mansion, is doing the pirate cat. So, which he pops up in almost every Bass Rankin anything you're going to hear paul freeze doing something he's just got such a great voice for characters like that but um you know this movie's gorgeous it's just gorgeous i love everything start to finish absolutely and i feel like and not to not to kick the garfield movie uh too much but like i had just seen it yesterday and it's all stunts, like a lot of it's stunt celebrity casting, like dogs in it playing a cat, mm -hmm. and he's in it for two minutes. He's just there because of Snoop Dogg, and right. like Chris Pratt is there because he's because a big voice name. acting role. <laughs> yeah, and he's a big name, and I I I miss the time when they were like seriously like focusing on getting great voice actors for certain things that made characters. And like, I occasionally have videos that pop up on my TikTok of like one that's hilarious is the voice of like Pinky, Mickey in the brain. And it was Seth Green redoing <laughs> the whole Anakin and Obi-Wan scene from Revenge of the Sith. And it's oh just like, God. Basically, it's Chris Griffin just being like, <laughs> you turn her against me. It's like that kind of stuff. It's like there's a lot of amazing voice actors out there and they mm -hmm. don't get cast in big movies. Right. And no. like, it's so great having something like this. Like, obviously, there's big names in this, too. But like, there's so many great voice act, like character voice actors that are just sprinkled mm -hmm. into this movie. And they made big careers out of like popping oh, yeah. up and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. And they definitely add so much color and personality to it. And like Mia Farrow is great as the unicorn. There's a sense of innocence there. And she has a very beautiful voice. Um, Colin Arkin is a derpy wizard. <laughs> it's so it's, much fun. He's so much fun in this. And like you can you can hear the youth in his voice still. Like, it's really just a different Alan Arkin than we are yeah. kind of accustomed to at this point. So, like, it's really fun to hear him in that role. And it needed a lot of character in the voice mm -hmm. because that is, that's a character right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, Schmendrick. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. The names are so good, too. Mm hmm because like this has some, Fortuna. Like, <laughs> this has some great like fantasy movie names like oh, if yeah. you don't take the time to come up with some great fantasy movie names you're doing something wrong mm -hmm. like For of sure. course you have a wizard named schmendrick and, and a king haggard <laughs> that's scary like yes. <laughs> he is Which, he is king haggard like throwing christopher lee's voice into anything this adds so much richness uh. and depth and everything and this film, like I mentioned before, is so beautiful. And the fantasy world created in this film is just so gorgeous. Um, the design of the unicorn is beautiful. And there's some creepy imagery as well as I'm like, I'm going through like the images on uh, IMDb oh, yeah. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And like the one poster with like this, even just like, the flaming oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and just in the Which, contrast with that was the initial cover that was on all mm -hmm. the video boxes like back like that was the original cover of hard. all the videos and it's <laughs> like whoa <laughs> like this is scary that bull is coming for that unicorn <laughs> well and like it, there's few times that i've like watched an animated movie where it's just like, you have something that just like burns in your brain like that and like i remember i didn't even watch the whole film but like I was at a friend's house and their dad was watching Princess Mononoke and I saw the opening scene with like the diseased boar and like that just like burns in your brain and like this is one of those kinds of images like this giant flaming uh bowl yeah, he's just... and just it's those kinds of things where it's like and just forcing fantasy. them into the sea like that too 
It's not like he's just chasing. Like you see him force those unicorns into the ocean. Like they have no choice. Like they're going. And it's this dark. is a creature that's like it's that's rough. Like especially the and then you see that castle, like the outline of that castle hanging overlooking the cliff. Like that is a creepy place to be. It's so much great design um in particular because like that's the beauty of animation when it comes to fantasy that's why fantasy is so hard to make work in live action is mm. the limitations for a long time right. like right. now with what special effects can do you can do so much but um it just seems like a lot of studios are not allowing their special effects team to take the time to do so so yeah, now it just looks like, like not to kick something else when it's down um i read all 15 wheel of time books i am not a fan of this amazon show and i'm like you look like you're cosplaying at the renaissance fair mm -hmm. <laughs> in a lot of ways yeah. and like but with animation you can and this is so beautifully hand-drawn everything mm -hmm. and there's just so much personality about it and it's that classic kind of adventurous fantasy story of like mm -hmm. this unicorn's exploring and trying to see am i the last one and you know it's about the friends you meet along the way the enemies you meet along the way the antagonists the strange characters you know like angela Lansbury. oh my gosh about. yeah it's just it's such a wonderful and like is there like a tight story to this no but it's one of those wonderful kinds of films that, like, for 90 minutes, I'm completely lost in this animated mm -hmm. fantasy world with beautiful everything. Mm -hmm. And you're just enjoying the experience. Yeah, I just, every scene's gorgeous. I love the translation of the unicorn to a human. I, mm -hmm. I think was really great how they made Amalthea. Um, like, I like the unicorns in the ocean the way they incorporated mm -hmm. that, that they were there the whole time and you didn't see yes. it. But then if you look around the castle, there's also unicorns built in to a lot of the aspects of the castle. So mm -hmm. when she's on a balcony, there's a unicorn head actually built in, like instead of like a gargoyle or something, it's a unicorn. Yeah. And you'll see that in the hallways and stuff throughout the castle too, which I thought was really a nice touch to keep it flowing. Like, cause that's what King Hagrid loves. That's the only thing that's bringing him joy yeah. is these unicorns. And the fact that he's got them all around him is actually pretty cool because it's such a dour, like just despicable place to be, but it still has all this beauty hidden everywhere. Oh, and he is like, rough. Look at this man. <laughs> Yeah, if this does not scream, I'm a villain in a kids' no. animated film, then like, oh, I think that has to be what the Care Bears use the you to make their first villain. Because if you watch the first episode ever of Care Bears from like '84, that's mm -hmm. what the bad guy looks like. <laughs> he it's is a bad, it's a great bad guy look, yep. and it just this builds up to such a great climax too that feels so impactful and like just the imagery of like unicorn meeting giant flaming yeah. bull like on the beach and it's just like this this is a conflict like I feel this and yeah. like I grew up probably the main animated film that I watched a lot as a kid that wasn't Disney was uh Secrets of Nim mm -hmm. and like there's so much creepy, great imagery and design all around oh, yeah. that. And like, this has that kind of level of intricate design and like everything has a purpose. Like his cat, the castle at the end, mm. look like this looks like the climactic castle you're going to find at the oh, end yeah. of the with this fantasy movie. So this one, just the music, the beauty of it, just all oh, of my it gosh, coming yeah. together. Some of the music is so hauntingly beautiful too. And what's crazy is, is it the Simon and Garfunkel song that's in it that Jeff Bridges actually sings it. Uh, Mia Farrow doesn't. But that song gets used in a lot of other things. Like it was in an episode of the Orville. Like, <laughs> like there's an episode where they find a cell phone from like the 90s or whatever. And like Malloy makes like a holodeck kind of image of the chick that owned it. That's the song she sings the entire episode. <laughs> It's just like so bizarre when I hear it other places because I'm like, I know this song. Why do I know this song? And I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> The Last Unicorn. Somebody was a fan. 
like somebody liked that movie. There's no way they just chose that. <laughs> like, well, and that's the thing too, because like this was this came out at like such a formative time for a lot of filmmakers now. And you can imagine like this making that kind of impact and popping up in things. And that's that's the positive and negative of like, you know, film being made by fans of film and then also a lot of things being derivative of the things that they grew up with. But like, obviously, this is one of those classic kind of fantasies that is certainly worth a watch, especially if you haven't seen oh, yeah. it. And um, if you grew up in the 80s, you obviously watched this, right? It's oh, like, yeah. Oh, my gosh. You couldn't. Like, I feel like it was in the rotation on like HBO or something like mm -hmm. there wasn't Disney movies on channels like that. So if you had like Cinemax and HBO and um, I think there was one other one, there were three like channels that weren't Disney. So they had a kind of limited stable of, you know, animated things that weren't. <laughs> Disney mm -hmm. movies so these were kind of the ones that's where I found them initially and then you know you'd find them popping up at the video store after that so that's why this was one that we saw like a lot because it just was on <laughs> absolutely it's like bringing back those memories of going to the video store mm -hmm. yeah for sure Pepperidge Farm remembers yeah. now <laughs> we got two more which these were are a little bit more obscure. We have the Flight of Dragons, which was, oh. which is also same an year film for mm -hmm. Ryan Bass, yep. and this is a young Boston writer goes back in time into an era where wizards and dragons reign, and science is just barely known. So this is taking on that kind of like science versus fantasy and magic and stuff like that, which is a classic kind of conflict and it's it's an interesting idea of having like a modern character game thrown back into a place like this but cheers what are some of the things that really stood out to you about this one um this has also been one of my favorites since that same time we, we used to watch mm. lost unicorn and the flight of dragons constantly and we wore that tape out i can't even tell you how many times so i love the dragons i mean how do you not love the art mm. like just everything about the visuals in this film are just so amazing i love that you know the dragons of the ocean were different from the dragons of the like the earth i love yep. that the brothers all have very distinctive looks because they're over different realms yep. um you know i love john ritter as sir peter is great i mean that was such a great choice like i love hearing him in this is just always such a joy but um you know, the story's cool, but it's not like a crazy long quest that you get like tired of the questing aspect of it. I mean, this was like a three day quest. Like if you, it was not long, it took yeah. them longer to like get started than it did. To, I think they were gone three days when you actually like look at it. It's like, you know, the night of dra and two dragons leave the next day, they pick up a couple of people and then they're pretty much there. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, they're, they're going and getting this done. They're not dragging it out. But um, ah. I love, <laughs> <laughs> but James Earl Jones, amazing voice mm -hmm. cast. Again, like the villain has the right voice and yeah. that just is so ominous. Like when you hear him like talking about them throughout the quest, you're scared for them, you know, cause he's coming for them and mm -hmm. you know, he's not holding back. And the, all the evil thing, like they all have that look, that really stereotypical like Rankin Bass bad guy look to all the villainous creatures. They've all got the same kind of faces, like the the sand, um, what are they? The the lemming things, the sand something <laughs> so when they come. I can't remember what they're called, the sand scripts or something. But they have the same face that the worm has, that the ogre has, the they all have that like really evil villain face. But, you know, and they've all got different ways that they're going to try to, you know, take out, you know, our heroes. And I just, I love the, the dragons, though, more than anything. I absolutely love the character design. And I think it's really cool that they use the, um, the actual artist from the book is the one that did the concept art. So Wayne Anderson was... illustrated the book, The Flight of Dragons, which was by Peter Dickinson. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's kind of just like an encyclopedia on dragons and how they lived and flew. So the movie is an amalgamation of that and another book um, 
what's it called? The Flight of Dragons was, was the, like the basis for all the Peter Dickinson and kind of the, part, and then the, the Dragon, Dragon and the and George, George. Yeah. was where they got most of the plot and the characters from. So I found this really amazing website called Drawn to Imagination, and they actually side by side the concept art that Wayne Anderson drew with how the character ended up looking and like Omidon, Carolinas, all of those end up looking almost like identical to what he suggested be, you know, the source material. So that was really cool. Like Gorbash looks almost the same Smurgle. I mean, they really took what he drew and ran with it, which I thought was cool because he's the one that like lived that story while it was being written. So, you know, he understood the characters more than anyone else. So the fact that they got him to do it was really cool. And this the amount of detail that went into, you know, making everyone a little bit different. It's not like you do kind of see in the group shots of the flight that there are similarities, but they all still are a little different. Like everyone's got a different horn, a different flare of some kind. Like their eyes are different. Their feet are different. Like they don't just have, you know, a big mass of dragons that are all the same different colors. Like they're similar different colors but they all have some defining feature and i think that's pretty cool yeah like long before how to train your dragon uh grabbed all of our attentions with dreamworks it's like this is that kind of film where it's just like you just get lost in this world of dragons and they mm -hmm. all have really cool designs and interesting and stand out the color um choices and stuff like that which also when i first looked at this poster it's I'm like, horrible yeah, and I'm just like, this does not capture the value and beauty of the animation in this movie. And that's the only cover it's ever had. Like, I've it's never seen so another cool. cover choice. And that's still the cover choice if you get the DVD. It's ridiculous because mm -hmm. it's the most cartoonish, horrible interpretation of these beautiful characters I could imagine. That's... I don't even understand. Like, it's like they found an animator that didn't work on the project and said, oh, my God, we need a cover for this right now. Can you put something together? Oh, that was definitely the marketing part. Like a hundred percent. Like, oh my gosh, we didn't pick a scene. Like, I need you to do something. Yeah, like and then you have this. Or just like, like the... why wouldn't you put Briog on the cut? Like, I would a hundred percent have like even Briog when he's fighting with Sir mm. Warren, like something like that to capture more of what this is about than oh hey, Carolina's on a really cartoony Gorbash. It's horrible looking. Yeah, and I think it like, does the movie a disservice, honestly. <laughs> well, like you look at that cover it's like well that looks silly and stupid yeah. but like this is this has that like rich hand-drawn animation mm -hmm. the colors there's a grit to this world too mm -hmm. um there's scary elements like there's dark forces that are at work oh, yeah. and like the it was such a special time because like i'm trying to think you, we don't get a ton of animation like this anymore where it's just like that high fantasy kind of stuff and i get like sensibilities change but like if you really want to find a time period for like real hard high fantasy kind of stuff and just like that late 70s early 80s and the, the 80s with these animation animated films and just like getting lost in a world of magic and dragons and i love the framing of all of this through a man of science who's plopped right in it and trying to process all of this because like if you're a person of science it's like it's seeing like you have to be able to see it. it's like this is all alive in front of him and that whole entire right. process and john ritter was just i remember when he passed away so unexpectedly and he was such a treasure Mm -hmm. um so funny and he brings so brought so much like empathy to his characters and he just really connected and he's great in this and like you said james earl jones like if you need a voice of power right you like, have that's Christopher it. Lee and james earl jones mm -hmm. and just bring that base and yeah. Because, like, I remember watching Conan the um, Bar Barbarian for the first time and just having him as that sorcerer and just, like, he's a scary villain. Yeah. And, like, here, like, this is a frightening person and you just feel it because there's so much depth and richness mm -hmm. to his voice. And then he can do the same kind of voice, but there's a richness and there's an empathy and a warmth with, like, Mufasa. Mm -hmm. 
Right. And that's that's great voice acting, being able to make something work like that. And let's not forget, James Earl Jones did one of the probably the most iconic voice <laughs> of all time, being right. Darth Vader. Like, <laughs> which to me it seems so crazy that at this point they got him to do this for it's such an obscure studio it's not like mm-hmm. it was a disney movie it was like no. hey guys like we make these like dorky christmas specials that everyone loves but we're also doing yeah. these like kind of nutsy uh out there fantasy things so you want to be our bad guy like it's <laughs> i want to be a part of this it's so crazy that yeah like i i think it's amazing that he did it i'm so glad he did because i don't mm. think you feel the doom if you don't have a voice like that and they'd already you know used christopher lee at the same time so i mean they got the two best villainous voices they could for that mm. time like in the same year these movies came out the same year so these are being made at the same time like that's so crazy to me that they got this caliber of actor to do both of these things at the same time for stories that people don't know like these are stories that like if you had ever said oh did you read the flight of dragons I'd be like no is that a book i mean <laughs> like these aren't stories anyone knew mm-hmm. and i think it's really amazing that they put that amount of talent and time into these because they're gorgeous i had never heard of this film before you no one ever it. has no one and ever has <laughs> people should if you watch how to tra- if you love how to train your dragon you can go back and watch this which is what i tell like- people all the time mm-hmm. like i'm like look you love how to train your dragon you should totally watch this movie <laughs> give it a try and just to reinforce the importance of a villainous voice here's a perfect example why aladdin Jafar works so well because his design and mm. that voice. He oh, is yeah. slimy. He's slithering. He's like a snake. That his staff is literally a snake. It's like mm. that's him. Mm. Uh the glow up that they did for the live action Jafar. Yes, live action Jafar was a pretty man, <laughs> but like yeah. not memorable at all. <laughs> it's just no. like. And this is why these characters work so well in animation. Like, you got Jeremy Irons to be Scar and just was so yeah. good. Oh, and just, man. Like, and, you know, that's why it's so important for voice casting. But we have one more Yay. film here. And it's even C- more obscure. Sea <laughs> Prince and the Fire Child. From 1981, a sea, a prince of the sea, and a child of fire engaged in a tragic, forbidden romance. And uh, this is an anime, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. and so, like, this is some like early 80s anime from Masami Hata. And I remember, like, I've never heard of this film before. There was one anime film that I watched as a kid, and it was. Um, the little Nemo film mm-hmm. that you know, based off of Slumberland and stuff like that, and is very much an anime. I didn't really watch a whole lot of anime until I got older, not even like Studio Ghibli. I didn't watch that stuff until I was mm-hmm. at least a teenager or in college. But like, anime so cool, and oh, yeah. they have no reservations either because like they're not making right. these for like american audiences no. or anything or like children that. like so they're doing whatever they want to do i mean they're gonna kill people and they're gonna make it dark and they're gonna make it violent and but not this one i think the reason why i've seen it so many times obviously is because it doesn't go too over the top with that kind yeah. of stuff and um the nudity kind of aspect of it is toned down enough where you're not just straight up seeing you know like there's it's like more silhouettes than anything else, but they're gorgeous. Yeah. The way they animate the fire children are mm-hmm. just amazing. And that's hand drawn in like 82 or what is it? Is this one 81? So, I mean, this is all a hundred percent hand drawn, you know, the sea and enemies and the oceans and the, anytime there's a scene where you see like a lot of background action, it's amazing. The amount of detail and movement that's yes. going on. I mean, it's just so impressive to me uh, just looking at, especially when they dance around the flames, like anytime that flame, like the the eternal flames going and you see the fire children dancing around it, that is just an incredible amount of skill that went into that because there's so much going on, so many colors, so many layers to the animation and it's gorgeous. It's And the two main, um, 
Hyperia and Oceanus are um, insanely gorgeous. I think they are just so well drawn. I love the, you know, the concept they went with for the two of them is just amazing. They're so beautiful. And then you have that contrasted with these very Sanrio characters that have the very kawaii look. And like you can see Sanrio's influence on this film because they're the company that, you know, I guess was producing this uh, like this particular wow. one so that's why you see these things that are just stark contrasts to the elegant beauty of some of the characters but then the really rounded cartoony kawaii look of a lot of the aquatic characters so i think that's kind of cool um especially if you watch the end credits and you see the very detailed drawings of everyone of all the characters and what they were meant to look like mm -hmm but you take those side by side with the cartoony versions that got into the film. It's really interesting. Like, especially characters like Bibble, like he looked uh, nothing like that. Really. It was, I mean, he's a dude with a tail with a horn, but it's a gorgeous fawn like creature yeah. that he looked like in, in the, in the end credits and just the artistry in this movie is just really, I mean, it, it's Romeo and Juliet. The story is not what yeah. you're watching for. You know, it's really the, about the visuals on this one. And I just love them. It's the visuals. It's the feel. It's the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. The scale, too. Like, the mm -hmm. vastness of yeah. the ocean and these worlds. And, like, the depth of animation yeah. in terms of, like, the backgrounds and everything. You have, like, giant sea dragon mm -hmm. uh, looking characters and stuff like that. It's so cool. And... It's always so interesting, like, you brought up the fact that, like, some of these characters were supposed to look a certain way, and then this is how they're rendered. It's so cool looking at concept art of characters, mm -hmm. and even, like, I love the Kung Fu Panda movies, and whenever they do those, like, animated flashbacks or whatever, it's just, like... <laughs> I love I this would have been so cool if the whole movie was like this. That's why I like the one P Kung Fu Panda short more than anything else because it's all basically in that because it's all them yeah. telling their origin stories. So almost mm -hmm. the entire 30 minutes is that style and I love it. Like it's, it's like you're so beautiful to me. look at. Yeah, it's like why did you tease me with these gorgeous like, you know, cuz doesn't is it the first one that even started out with that? One yes. of them starts with that and I'm like, "Oh my yeah. gosh, it's going to look like this. This is great." And then you see what happens to the pandas in the second one in that animation, and you're just like, "Why are you showing me the rest like, of this?" Why do you movie? keep fooling me like this? Like, stop it! I love that. Stop doing like, that to me. <laughs> this movie has that interesting feel where it's like it's teasing you with some of the characters, some of the could have looked like. And, and it's like you get back underwater, and you're like, "Well, even you know, Sirius is almost there, but then he's got those big dorky feet." that don't even have like toes or flippers or like they're just they're just big round bleh. like i don't even know how to they round look like blocks. little marshmallows they're just round like a rounded lego foot <laughs> like... and that's so interesting too when you have like certain characters it's like the stuff that you spend the time on details on and then like mm -hmm. the other things it's like it's so weird when you have like instances like that where it's just like you're watching something it's like wow that looks so gorgeous don't look at that yeah it's like they gave up. like waist down. They're just like, it doesn't need to matter from the waist down. We're good. Just do not put any detail whatsoever from the, the hips down. And that's exactly, if you look at his character, that's what he looks like. I'm like, that's so weird. Because it's a good thing they had the detail on top though, or otherwise he would look so bizarre next to Malta that you'd be like, why are these, this don't even look right together. <laughs> well, and this this film was an experience. And I feel like that's like the easiest way to explain it. It's just you're getting lost in this beautiful mm -hmm. animated world. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it's a pretty simple story of like, hey, oh, yeah. It's a fantasy version of Romeo and Juliet. They're not mm -hmm. supposed to be together. The no. families are mad. It's like, why do you want to be with them? It's like elemental mm -hmm. in the same basic kind yeah. of idea recently. It's just like, it's a timeless story. Mm -hmm. But this is such a cool, interesting world and everything that I hope people check this out. Like, I'm pretty sure I watch this on YouTube. Yeah, and that's where I, I wish, usually watch it too. Wish there was a nicer. I like, have a DVD copy of it, but it, it's the it's the Japanese version, but there's no um, subtitles, which makes it 100% just a visual experience. So mm -hmm. don't really watch that too much. I guess if you've <laughs> watched it plenty of times and you're just right. like... 
I, I know, I know what's going on. Yeah. So I do watch it, but it's rough because, you know, if you've never seen it, you're not going to watch that version because it has zero subtitling. But even the only other thing I'll mention is that the orchestra is, I think that adds the other layer you need to really just keep your interest in such a simple story. Because I don't think if you didn't have that really beautiful, enchanting orchestra going on the whole time, you're not as interested in what's going on because you're not as immersed. And I think it all just works really well together and it's just beautiful. Absolutely. So we just gave you four wonderful engrossing animated fantasy films some that'll haunt your dreams afterwards and others that'll <laughs> just you know take you to a whole different place and make you feel good and forget about everything else um <laughs> to forget about the rotoscope people <laughs> in uh in, Brie, in, in lord of the rings but Patrice, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on and for suggesting these four films. So like some of these I had never seen before. So I was excited to check them out. I'm just so glad other people are going to hear about them now because I think, you know, they're all definitely worth like seeing, especially if you're a lover of animation. I think it's something that is definitely worth your time. I'll be recommending this to my buddy Joe to see if he, I'm a hundred percent sure he's seen like the last unicorn and Lord of the Rings, but I don't know if he's seen flight of dragons and sea prince and fire child. So We'll have to see. And that's the whole point of this. It's spotlighting. So this is another episode of Wasteland Spotlight wrapping here on the Wasteland Wasteland Talks talk show. But Patrice, thank you so much for coming on. No problem. Thanks for having me. And thank all of you out there for always tuning in and supporting your Wasteland Reviewer.